Come get started the service tonight. See everybody. Good to be back in the Lord's house. I'm so thankful for this. Another wonderful day the Lord's given us another opportunity to be able to come out. Hope you've been praying for the lot today. Looking forward to another service. Really uh, appreciate that good message. Brother Doug last night did a wonderful job. And uh, appreciate that. I was thinking about one thing he was talking about last night. He said he tried to do things on his own. Aren't we like that so many times? Especially men, it seems like. Do you ever uh, buy a piece of cheap furniture or a gas grill or something and you go to put it together and you get about half of it done and something ain't working quite right? And you think, where's the instructions at? I know my son in law, we put a lot of stuff together for the baby and stuff. I'd say, when all else fails, look for the instructions. <laughs> but as a Christian, we shouldn't wait a lot of else fails. Should we? God's words are instruction book for life. And, you know, when we try to get out and do things on our own without knowing what God's word says, we want to make a mess of it. How much better off would we be to study God's word, find out what it says, and then apply that to our lives and save ourselves so much trouble down the road? Yes. Good message. Anybody have any needs tonight you want to mention or you know about? Before we pray. Big load. Yeah. Big load. But God can help. I'd of course remember my sister Nancy, she got saved last in her legs. Also, uh, Rick and Gilbert Sizemore, we saw her for a few minutes this afternoon. She <coughs> been pretty pitiful. So I told her we prayed for her, so I was there. Saw him, saw him years, but I uh, always had respect for him. Really thought the world of him. Steve Burris uh, still needs our prayers. I hadn't heard anything last day or so, but uh, he's got a couple issues, you know, that we can pray about. And Huey, Huey's burden, I know with that. Let's pray for that family. A lady that I work with, her grandmother's in the last stages of death, and uh, they got hospice. Just pray for that family. They run and try, try to take turns taking care of her. Just ask God's mercy. She's a good, godly, Christian lady. Just ask the Lord to show favor and grace. Take her home to heaven. be a, uh, obedient to the Holy Spirit tonight. Yeah. Be nothing else, and they'll all stand to the Lord in prayer. He knows exactly every need better than we do. He knows how to fix it better than we do, that's for sure. David McNichol, would you lead us in prayer?
And everybody that would, come on and help us sing the choir. You can sing back there too. You know what Brother Combs said last night when they started in the battle? They told the singers to go first. You know what? Come on, singers, let's sing. Because <laughs> we're getting ready to get in the battle because the devil tried to cheat us every, out of everything tonight. Yeah. If we're ready, we can't let him.
church. They're going to do some singing for us. I always enjoy their singing and their music. I tell you what, if you're on Facebook and you got there, I guess for over a year now, they've been singing almost every evening now they're home. What a blessing. I don't know how many hundreds of songs they know. <laughs> but some of the older songs you haven't heard in years. Y'all got to check that out. If you have to do it. Y'all make yourself at home. Whatever. <laughs> What? I thank the Lord for being able to be here tonight. You know, a few years ago, you wouldn't have got me up here. You couldn't have hog tied me. That's right. <laughs> That's right. But, you know, the Lord saves your soul. You can do anything that He wants you to. That's right. But sing. I can't do that. You try. Taking good care of you. Yes. yes. He sure is me.
of nervous people. You don't have to be nervous here, brother. There's only two Democrats in the crowd. <laughs> to know tonight that the devil is a liar. The father of lies and the fruit of the Thank you, Sister Lynn. And I promise not to go an hour like Pastor Doug's afraid I would if I had this. <laughs> Unless the Lord leads me. Amen. The Lord leads me to be all right. Though. Exodus chapter 34. I want to visit with you just a moment and thank God for his grace and his mercy. We have at least two churches that we call sister churches, which means they're brothers and sisters or part of our family. And Pine Mountain Cross Holiness is one of them. He's still from full gospel. I wish we'd get some together. Mm -hmm. Maybe he's still from full gospel. One of the preacher children and his son of his precious, precious people. But uh, Brother David uh, Bumgarner told me one time after we started being together and worshiping the Lord together. He said, you know, we've kind of got this triangle covered. We've got Pine Mountain up here on this hill here in Virginia. We've got Sparta over here. And then we've got Elk and those that knows where Elk in North Carolina is down in that part. But we just love y'all so much. We, uh, again, I know Facebook's got a lot wrong with it. 
Like I said last night, one Sunday we're telling people the evils of Facebook. Next Sunday we're telling them to turn in the Facebook Live and, 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 and hear the service. But there's a lot of good things, and we try to keep up with y'all. Uh, your pastor's been preaching some wonderful, wonderful sermons. And again, as I said a while ago, others too. And the singing, uh, it just blesses my heart, and I'm so thankful. And then we keep up on, on the friends list some too. I don't have a Facebook page. It's my wife. She finally put my name on there. But uh, that's all right. But I like to see the things that's going on, some of the pretty flyers and all that's going on with the grandkids. Thankful to hear that when they got saved. and how wonderful? <laughs> my, that thrilled my heart. I like to shout when I read about her getting saved. God is so good, but we love you. You have a pastor who loves you and a precious wife. We're so thankful for him. I enjoyed seeing that picture of you when you was just a little fellow. Just a little fellow. And you was, you was young, too. I don't know if y'all remember having that on a Facebook page in the family when you were real young. <laughs> Pastor Doug even looked young. <laughs> so it was really good. But we just love y'all so much, and we try to uh, pray for y'all and lift y'all up. And, and you, you, you're you just a part of our family. It's going to be a wonderful thing to get together in heaven one day, ain't it? My sit down and just give him praise and honor and glory and not have nothing to rush about. What a day that's going to be. On Exodus chapter 34, and we're going to be looking in this portion of scripture here. You might want to keep the, the Bibles open right in here. And we're going to be looking a little bit about Moses. I want to talk tonight, if the Lord will help me, and I believe this is a message from the Lord. This is a message I need. A place by me. A place by me. Exodus 34, and the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tablets of stone, like unto the first. He doesn't mean to do this one time. And I will write upon these tablets the words that were in the first tablets, which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning into Mount Zion, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount. Neither let the flocks nor the herd, the herds, feed before that mountain. And he hewed two tablets of stone, like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning, went out into Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and stood in his hands, and, and took in his hands the two tablets of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud. Can you picture this? I want you to just take my time. I want us to picture what's going on. I want you to just visualize what's happening. And the Lord descended and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Father, touch your word tonight. Lord, draw us near to you. Help us to realize, Lord, as we look at Moses in his life, help us to look, Lord, and realize you have a place by you for us. Lord, that your hand is upon us. Lord, that we're not somewhere in the wilderness and you don't know where we're at, but that, God, you are very present, you are very near. Lord, I pray that you help us in this last day and time to rise and to be the church that you to have us to be. In Christ's name I pray, amen and amen. If you look over just a couple of chapters before, you'll see the story and what's going on in chapter 32. You know the story very well. Israel had sinned against God. They had sinned against God. They had got weary of tearing and waiting on God in verse 23 of 32. And they say, and they said this, for they said unto me, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for the Moses, this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. They grew tired and weary of waiting on God. So again, as we mentioned last night, they wanted to do things their own way. And they pressed upon Aaron that he would make them a golden calf. That they might sin against God. That they might pray unto a golden calf. 
Now we look at that and we think how foolish can these people be? How crazy can they be? The God Almighty has delivered them. He's split the Red Sea. He's done so many miracles. He's kept his hand upon them. He's brought them through a wilderness. The pillar of fire by night that protected them. The cloud by the day that kept them cool. The manna that they walked out of the tent and there it was. But now yet here they run after something else. How about us? A lot of times when I'm pointing the finger at somebody else, the Holy Ghost every once in a while gets my attention and reminds me, look in the mirror. What about us? What all has God done for us? Where has he brought me from? He brought me from sin. He brought me from, from headed straight to hell. You see, if I had what I deserved tonight, I'd be in hell. But the grace of God saved me and bought me, started me on this journey. So why do I doubt him? Why, when, when, I, when I can't see and I don't realize exactly what God's doing and how God's working in my life. You see, I live in the same world you do. I see things coming, and I thank God what's going on, what's happening. I don't understand what's going on right now. This should not be going on. But instead of doing those things, I ought to trust God. He's not brought me here to leave me. He, even though I might not feel His presence at the moment, I walk by faith and not by sight. But the children of Israel grow tired and weary, and so they began to turn their thoughts on false gods. All the other places, all the other people have false gods, so we ought to have false gods. And they sought their own way. They refused to stand still, as we talked about last night, and seen the salvation of God work in their midst. Then in verse chapter 32, and on down about verse 32, Moses has came down off the mountain. And he realizes the sin that they have done. The great sin. And he's angry. He's upset because of their sin. His anger is kindled. But yet he prayed and interceded. The pastor, I believe I've been close enough to you that I know your heart. And there's people that you have on your heart and your mind. You lay at night in bed and you pray for People that have come so close to the grace of God. People, people that you know, they, they know the right way and yet they won't walk in the right way. And my anger, I'll be honest with you, my anger gets kindled sometimes. Brother Ricky, I want to reach out. I bet y'all used to see your children, didn't you? <laughs> I want to reach out and grab a hold of them and, and, and kind of get their attention just a little bit. But the Holy Ghost begins to talk to me. And I began to pray and intercede. God opened their eyes. God opened their understanding. God wake them up somehow. Help them to see where they're at. Help them to see the danger that they're in. For you see, man does not realize the danger that they're in. The children of Israel did not realize how close they were for the hand of God just coming down and wiping them out and destroying them. Moses there that moment when his anger was kindled, he began to pray and intercede. And he says this in verse 32. Yet now if I will forgive their sin and if not block me, I pray thee out of the book which I have written. That's some powerful praying, ain't it? And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever have sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. In other words, Moses, don't tell me what to do. Now, you might be one that goes to God and prays and tells him what to do. I'm not going to argue with you. But I try not to do that. Because he knows. I keep trying to get into our people's minds when they give prior requests that you don't have to tell everything that's going on. You don't have to tell what's wrong, what the doctor's done, what he's going to do. You've heard it, ain't you? Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. Take five minutes to give it. We, we don't need to tell God how to do this. All we need is a name and that they need prayer. And God's on the scene. God can't do the work. So God says, Moses, don't tell me who to blot out of the book. I'm going to blot out who I desire to blot out. But now listen, verse 34. Therefore, now go lead the people into the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, that angel, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon thee. You will not sin and get away with it. Child of God, you will not sin and get away with it. Oh, I know I'm in the holiness church. 
But I know children of God too. Come on. And you better get it covered and under the blood. The moment that spirit speaks to your heart, you better let him deal with it right then and there and take it under the blood. And he says, listen, there's coming a time I'm going to visit your sin upon you. And the Lord plagued the people there because they made the, because they worship, because they made the calf which Aaron made. Moses' anger was kindled, and yet he prayed that God's hand would be upon them and that God would save them. Now we see in chapter 33, and I'm laying a foundation to get to the point of my message tonight. We see in 33 and verse 7 that the tabernacle of the Lord was outside of the camp. If we could somehow grasp, you know, when we think about the children of Israel, it's hard for us to grasp the multitude of the children of Israel. It's hard for us to grasp the camp and how that each camp set around and the tabernacle of God set right in the middle of it. I'm glad God's in our midst, aren't you? Yes. Let me tell you, I don't ever want God to be outside of the camp. I don't want to ever take the tabernacle outside of the camp of the children of God. But because of their great sin, now Moses took the tabernacle and he pitched it without the camp, away from the people. And then as the people began to seek the Lord, they would come from inside of the camp and they would go out into the tabernacle and there they would seek the Lord. We find in verse 11, Joshua, you've heard of him, haven't you? Joshua, verse 11, the word of God tells us he would not leave the tabernacle. Would not leave. You see, there's coming a time and age, I believe, church, and I believe we're here now, when the church needs to get serious about seeking God. You know, preacher, give it to me quick. Come on. We, we don't want to carry around the altar and wait for the Spirit of God to fall in our midst. I mentioned last night, I can remember as a child, the saints of God around the altar. And it done getting late. They work probably way much more harder than we do today. But yet they did not worry about what tomorrow. Sometimes they would have four weeks revivals. I remember it. Four weeks revival. They would have it time and time again. And they'd be up around the altar worshiping and carrying and magnifying God. We need that to be a revival in our heart and in our life that we stand before God. Now Moses goes on and in verse 15 Moses is praying to God and I want you to notice something that he prays. Verse 15 of 33, he said unto, unto him, and this is Moses praying to God, and he said unto him, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. In other words, God, if you're not going, I'm not going. God, if you're not going to go, leave me right here. I, I, I'm not going to go without you. Listen, verse 16, for Wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thy Lord is with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Moses prayed this prayer, and you've heard it before, and he said in verse 18, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Now listen to what Moses said. Moses said, Lord, if I have found grace in thy sight. Think what a question that was just a moment. Here is Moses that was born a Hebrew, born to slave. Was, was to be killed because he was a boy. Should have been killed at birth. But the hand of God's grace, oh hallelujah, and his mercy was upon him. So that he was taken and placed in that river. Think about that, the hand of God. What could little old Marion have done if an alligator would have come? Nothing. How could she? She was there. The mom wanted to be sure the babe was protected. But it was not Mary that protected that baby. It was the almighty hand of God. 
How do you think that baby ended up right where Pharaoh's uh, uh, girl daughter was at? How do you think that baby ended up there where Pharaoh's wife was at? It was the hand of God. It was the hand of God that made it happen. So here is Moses now, and he's taken, and he's raised in Pharaoh's house, and his mama, think about this, moms. How would you like this to have happened when you was young? Somebody pay you to take care of your child. Wouldn't that be good? Room, feed you, board you, give you whatever you needed so you would take care of your own child. Is that not great? God there blessed him and was with him. He's with him there as Moses raised up and he, he'd rather be counted a curse and rather be counted all than, than to be counted as Egyptian. He'd rather be counted with God's people, whatever the cost was. So much so that he was driven into the wilderness. And in the wilderness there God meets him. You talk about grace. There's Moses going around in the wilderness in his mind. He, he, he just he can't realize what's going on and what's happening and what's taking place. And I, I catch myself there many times. I know you've done got so, so sanctified, so holified, so to speak, that, that you never find yourself in a wilderness or in, in bewilderment. But I'm there so many times. But I'm thankful that God, oh hallelujah, bless his holy name, will let me walk by and see a strange sight. He'll get my attention. And Moses walked by in the wilderness that day and he, he just had to turn aside. Pastor, there was a bush. It was on fire, but it wasn't burning. It wasn't being consumed and he couldn't figure that out. You know the story well. He'd drawn near and the Lord spoke to him and said, Moses, Take your shoes off for the ground upon which you stand is holy. And there God began to tell him what he was going to do in his life. And Moses, like me and you, began to offer excuses. But God said, I'll make a way. Aaron is already on the way, and he's going to be your mouthpiece. Think about grace, how that God used Moses, the, the miracles, how, how that God brought so many miracles in his life. When he came up to the Red Sea, and I'm not going to get in depth because you know the story better than I do, but he came up to the Red Sea and, and mountains on both sides, Pharaoh's army in behind him, the Red Sea there, the people were ready to kill him. Why didn't you leave us in Egypt where we was at? And Moses cries out to God, and God says, Moses, what's in your hand? Glory to God. You see, God already has the provisions there for us. You talk about grace. It's already, all we've got to do is reach out and believe God. All we've got to do is trust God. Amen. You know the story very well, how the Red Sea split and they went across on dry ground. The journey and the wilderness that I just mentioned, the hand of God was there. The grace of God was upon him. What do you mean if I have found grace in your sight? Surely I found grace in your sight. You found grace in the sight of God. If we're not, and I'm going to be plain, if you have not found grace in the sight of God, you more than likely will be dead and in hell. Did that? But the grace of God called, glory be to God, called you out, brought you out because of his great love that he had for you. And Moses then, when he began to think about the grace that God had showed him and the grace that God had given him and how God's hand had been upon him, he began to pray this simple little prayer and he said, Lord, show me your glory. Yes. Church, we've been blessed. Amen. I was talking to my dear Baptist friend today, Amen. minister. He's been preaching and ministering about the Holy Spirit in his church. For the last several weeks. I mean, he's been actually listening last night. I don't know if he's listening tonight. He, he really, he really, he, his church is getting on fire for God. We began to talk about the spirit and the presence and the power of God and how he calls and how he moves and, and the glory that we've seen. I see some of his people, he does Facebook now, they moved inside a little bit. And, and I noticed the other night all they could do is have a testimony service. I finally cut it off because I couldn't hear and it wouldn't do me any good, but I was just enjoying knowing they were testifying and the Spirit of God was moving. And the Spirit of God was moving. The Spirit of God is something that we need. The Spirit of God, that glory, 
I think about Pastor Doug, and I'm, I'm so glad. This, I'm not saying the Spirit of God's gone. I'm glad He still shows us His glory. But I can remember some services where the Spirit of God would fall. In fact, He did last Sunday, the Sunday before, and He fell here Sunday. Somebody told me they watched y'all yesterday and said, Oh my, they had one more service, didn't they? And I said, Well, that's what I hear. That's what I hear. The Spirit's moving. But I have seen those times, and you have, where the glory of God would just come down. I can remember a dear old sister of God, one, one particular service in the Rhonda Church many, many years ago. I was just a teenager, and the Spirit of God had failed. Or I was young, I don't remember if I was a teenager or not. And the Spirit of God had failed. And, and I'm telling you, everybody had just worshipped God, danced in the Spirit, shouted testified she was somehow at the back door. I don't remember how she got back there, but she was at the back door. She had one shoe on, one shoe off, and she said, and she was a pretty hefty lady like, like I am hefty, and she said, God, I just can't take anymore. I can't take anymore. I say that for a reason. Moses wanted to see the glory of God. Listen, verse 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness. The Lord speaking to Moses. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim. There's power. There's power in the name of the Lord. The devil don't want you to use that name. But here the Lord says, and he says, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, I want you to catch this. This is my message. Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. Glory to God. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the clay of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Do you realize he has a place for you? Jesus. My good Holy Ghost in this house. I don't know in 2020 if you needed a place or not, but I did. And all the way into 2021. Brother Jeff was speaking about, we started, I told you about how we started Facebook around March. I think it's March 9th. I don't remember. Someone's in there. And so we started just singing a song we thought we'd sing once in a while just to keep up with it and people began to say some people that I count as my sister, my family, they said please don't stop please sing every day we need that place well I'm so thankful we could come aside from the craziness of the world you see I, I'm sure like many of y'all I, I, I didn't hide away any words I worked every day Thank God that I was able to. I give him praise and honor and glory that I was able to. But we needed that place, and we need that place today. And that's the only reason I think we missed three days, one day. One day I think we missed, and we missed in these three days of revival that we hadn't sung. But the hand of God, a place, a place. I'm so thankful. Doug, I'm so thankful, Pastor, I'm so thankful that he has a place for me. Yeah. When that old devil comes with his lies and his doubts and his fears and his confusions, I know I have a place. Yeah. I see so often, and, and this pastor that I mentioned a while ago was talking about this the other day. He saw it happen in his church. And he saw a little child become fidgety. You know how they do when us preachers get going too long. We don't get real loud and keep their attention. And he saw that child finally, the mom would get him on up in her lap. Mm. I feel the Holy Ghost. And she got a hold of him. Just wrap those loving arms around. You know what he felt? Secure. Safe. Knew there was no problem. 
because he was in the right place upon mom's lap. Yeah. I'm thankful, Brother Ricky, that the father reaches yes. down. Yes. Yes. Whew, glory yes. be to God. Yes. How does he know right when I need him? How does he know right when I'm the most fidgetous and where, where are the most problems and the most care? How does he know? Because he has a place. He says, here, Doug, you, you, you getting out of that place. Come here, let me wrap my arms around you. Let me reassure you. Let me know. Let me make you sure that you have that place. Psalms 32, we won't read it tonight. I'm going to try to hurry. Psalms 32, verses 6 through 8, and then Psalms 119, 114 tells us about a hiding place. You've heard me mention Corey Ten Boom many times. She was a precious saint of God, if there ever was, a child of God. You know the story of her. I'm sure everybody here does. I won't get into it in great detail. But she wrote a book. She wrote several books, but especially The Hiding Place. And they had a hiding place that they hid Jews. They lived in Holland, had a little old watch clock shop there, and they hid Jews for as long as they could until they got caught. Her father was put in Nazi prison. Her sister Betsy was put in prison, and she was put in prison and treated so horrible. It's awful to hear the things that they went through. Her father died there, and her sister Betsy finally died. But she would tell about how God's grace you couldn't sneak nothing through. But somehow, and she can't explain how, she doesn't know how it happened, they ended up getting their Bible through. They put them in a dormitory, if you would call it that, a large hut with women in there. And I don't know how many people's ever read about the German war and, and the concentration camps, but the lady guards were the most sadistic of any guards that they were. Yeah. Horrible, horrible what they would do. But they would take that Bible and Betsy and Corey would teach. One of the things that Corey said that she despised and hated and cried out to God, God, I can't understand why you allow these lies. They just, the lies was just everywhere everywhere in that hut or that place that they stayed until one day there was a sadistic guard that was one of the most awful ones and she came by the door one day and they heard her heard someone say something about going in and checking this and she said no way will I go in that one because I'm afraid of all those lies a hiding place and that's something. In the worst of worst of worst, she began to seek the grace of God. This precious lady, I'm going to hush. This precious lady, when the war was over, her sister had been killed. Her father had died there. And the Lord begins to call her to minister. To begin to testify and tell the things of God. And of course, she says, yes, Lord, I will. You know where he sends her? Right into Germany. She said she was standing one day testifying before the church and talking about the grace of God. And as she was, she saw the door open and she saw an individual. You know those people that treat you the worst, you'll never forget them. They stay right here, don't they? You forgive them, but you always got that right there, hey? Then she saw that guard walk in. The guard that had treated her sister so hard. And he came in and he sat down on the back pew. And she thought, God, don't, don't make me, don't make me have to shake his hand or talk to him. After the service was over, he walked straight over to her. He knew her. He knew what he had done. But he found the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory to God. And she said as she reached that hand out to forgive him, the peace of God, that passive understanding, came into her heart and her life. And here was a brother. Why? 
Because he had found a place by God. Aren't you thankful? Don't matter how far you fall. Don't matter how bad you've messed up. People won't forget. People will keep it in their mind. But my God will save unto the uttermost. And he'll make a place right there. Right there beside him. For the worst sinner. He has a place for you. Isaiah 41. I'm going to try to draw it up close. These are verses of scripture that we have read, Isaiah 40 and 41, ever since March 9th of 2020. These verses have been very special to us at the Sparta Church of God. Isaiah 41 and verse 10. A place. He has a place for us. Isaiah 41 and 10, he says this, Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them, and shall not find them, even them that contend with thee. They that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. Why? Verse 13, for I, the Lord thy God, my mind, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, fear not, I will help thee. I don't know about you now, we're going, we're going to read verse 17. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I get a picture of a dad reaching down and grabbing that precious little girl's hand that's scared and fearful. There's something that they're doing, maybe crossing a bridge, walking over something, and he reaches in and grabs her hand. And just as soon as that dad grabs the hand of that child, there is a peace. Because dad's in charge. That's the way it is what the Father does for us as we walk through this world. He reaches down and he gets us by the right hand and he tells us. I'm glad he tells me. Fear not. I am with thee. You don't have to be afraid. Verse 17, listen to these words. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Edom, will not forsake them. Now, now, did you hear what he said? I, I want you to catch verse 17, what he said. When the poor and needy seek water, they're seeking water, but there's no water to be found. There is no water. There's no water. But listen what he says he'll do in verse 18. I will open rivers and high places. Glory to God. And fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. He'll do it for us. John chapter 14. Don't worry. If I take a drink, I'm not going to want any longer. John chapter 14, he says these words. The disciples are weary, they are tired. They don't understand the things that are happening. He begins to tell them not to fret, not to be afraid. He began to let them know that these things are going to take place. These things are going to happen. And he gives them this promise. He tells them, I'm going away. I'm going to go away. But if I go away. Yes. I don't know if you don't feel the Holy Ghost in this house tonight. Amen. I will Amen. come again. Amen. Brother Jimmy, I believe soon and very soon. Jesus Christ is going to step out on the clouds of glory. He's going to say, hey, I've had a place right by me. And I've walked with you down here. But I've been, my wonderful Lord, yes. I've been working on a place for you up here. It's a mansion like you've never seen. Glory to God. Streets are paved with gold. Foundations are not laid with old cinder block like we sell down here. They are 12 precious stones the foundations are. Walls is not drywall. It is jasper. 
and I have a place. I have, I mentioned Sunday, I have a white stone, he promises us. And in that white stone is a new name written down in glory. That means it's mine. And it's mine. Yeah. Pastor Doug. Come right on, brother. Yeah. Glory to God. Thank you, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Bow your heads with us tonight. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we've heard this good word tonight. Bless our eyes. I wonder if it is that God's got a place for us. Yes, Jesus. Lord, do we that are here tonight that have been born again of the Spirit of God have realized that in our lives? How precious that is to us, Lord. Yes, Jesus. To know that our names are in heaven. To know, Lord, through all the struggles of this life, we have your presence. Lord, that you have promised to never leave us forsake us. Thank you, Jesus. How grateful we are for that, the Lord. Lord, that undeserving as we are, mm -hmm. God has rained grace, times grace yes, upon us. Lord, here tonight, Lord, we have people that love God. Yes, Father. We have people here tonight, Lord, that I don't know where their hearts are with God. I, I don't know. Yes, Jesus. But you know. And I just pray that in this moment, Lord, in this yes, moment, that, Lord, that you would place everything out of our minds tonight yes, by your providential power. Yes, Father. And Lord, in this time, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would speak, <laughs> that he would draw. Lord, you have blessed us beyond anything we know tonight. The Lord has said in our heart tonight that there might be one here that's not saved that would leave here tonight unsaved. Lord, for the grace of God yes, is here to save. Yes. And the Holy Spirit is witnessing. Thank you, Father. I just pray that you've had your way. With every head bowed tonight, just before we bring the church down to pray. Seek the Lord. There may be somebody here in this audience tonight. Does not know Christ. The night that you feel that the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart, you know that you need to move. Don't let the devil talk to you as the greatest thing that you'll ever do in this life. Yes, Lord. And that is to receive Christ as your personal Savior. Yes, Lord. If you're here tonight, we're going to call the congregation down and have a closing prayer here tonight. Pray for the sick, whatever the needs may be. Yes, Lord. This is your night. This is your night. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling you tonight. That drawing power. For he yes, must Lord. do that. He must do that in your life. Yes, Jesus. These will be the moments that are precious to you. When the Lord deals with your heart. Tells you how much he loves you. And what he did for you in order that you might have life everlasting. So church, if you would come tonight, all the church would come. And if you're here tonight. Yes, you've never been saved. You've never committed your yes. life to Christ. You've come to. Yes, you've come.